recording. So as I said before, if you just came in, um, today we're going to be doing day two of momentum. And so today's going to be our last day of the momentum unit. We're going to do a little review. Um, and after the review, we're going to do a Kahoot. After the Kahoot, we're going to do some momentum workbook questions from the College Board. Um, if you don't know where the workbook is, you can just go into Google Classroom and you will find it in the material section. Um, it's a link. You know, it's uh, you just press on it and it will bring you to um, the workbook. The workbook includes all practice questions from all the different units so of AP Physics 1. So it's a very, very good source that you guys could use. All right, so we're going to start off with the review. So we can go back into last week's slides. Um, basically, we started off with what momentum is, right? Momentum is basically um, very related to energy. Energy and momentum go hand in hand, okay? So momentum is more of like how, and we also talked about inertia, right? In dynamics, we talked about inertia with forces. So if you're asking what's the difference between momentum and inertia, momentum is more of how hard it is to change um, the direction of something. But inertia is more of like how hard it is uh, for me to stop something from moving. So you don't necessarily, for momentum, you don't necessarily have to stop moving, um, but you can change your direction. But if for inertia, it doesn't mean you're necessarily changing your direction. It just means you're stopping. So um, that's kind of the difference. If someone says you have inertia, it's more of like a measurement of how hard it is for you to stop. Uh, let's say you're running, right? And um, compared to a heavier person, right? And you're lighter, um, that person has more inertia because he has more mass. Okay, so it's more of how hard it is to stop, whether um, on the other hand, compared to momentum, momentum is more of how hard it is for me to change the direction of something. So let's say I'm, I'm running in a circle, right? How hard it is for me to continually running in that circle if I increase my velocity, stuff like that, or a collision, right? If I hit a car, I will change the direction. I'll go backwards or I'll continue going forwards. Um, that's more of what momentum is. All right, and if you wanted a exact um, definition, it's basically the strength or force that something has when it is moving, um, the strength or force that allows something to continue or to grow stronger, or um, and in physics is the property that a moving object has due to its mass and its motion. Okay, and also um, if you don't know, right, momentum actually comes, I'm sorry, dynamics, which is basically forces, actually come from momentum. Okay, so you know how, okay, um, I'll just move on to the next slide. So the formula that we use is P equals ME. P is the variable for momentum. Um, if you're asking me why we use the letter P, I really have no idea because um, it's kind of weird because physics uh, physicists in the past, they would just take a variable or um, a letter that was not used in the physics um, field and they would just use it as um, this word, right? It doesn't start off with M because we already have mass as M. But basically, this is the equation that we use. P equals mv. M is your mass in kilograms, and velocity um, is your v in meters per second. So if you kind of see the equation, right, you get m times v. And basically, where you get the net force or Newton's second law comes from momentum. Um, though you, in physics C, you might do like a derivation with calculus or something. But in a sense, if you're doing algebra, you could think of the change in momentum as um, mv final minus mv initial. Right, and let me just show this with you guys. So, let's try to draw this out. So we know that P, okay, that's here. Right, we know that P equals MV, right? And your change in momentum is PF minus P initial. And since your, your mass is the same, right? Um, your mass is changing mom in momentum, you would just say um, mv final minus mv initial, right? And you since you have m in both sides, you can factor out the m. So you would get m parentheses vf minus vi. And when you have vf minus vi, that is the change in velocity. So you would actually get m delta v. And your change in velocity is the same thing as acceleration, right? Change in velocity over time. But that's how you kind of get the equation MA. This is not a very specific way of how you would get Newton's second law, but you should know that Newton's second law actually comes from momentum. Um, and this is like, a, it's, not, it's like in a big picture, right? How would you get uh, P equals MA? 
CFD and also Newton's second law, which is the net force equals mass times acceleration. All right. Um, let's see. All right. So we're... Um, also, right, momentum is a vector quantity because it, it considers direction. When you're talking about velocity, you're talking about a, a vector. So therefore, momentum is also a vector meaning it has a magnitude and it has a direction. If someone says you have a momentum compared to inertia, inertia does, is a scalar quantity because it's only dependent on mass. The more mass you have, the more inertia you have, but it does not necessarily mean that you have a direction of your inertia. It just means that you have this amount of inertia or this amount of mass. And inertia and mass is um, inter, you could use the words interchangeably, um, but they basically mean the same thing. If your mass increases, you have more inertia. Okay, if your mass decreases, you have less inertia. But momentum is, it considers direction. You could have a momentum that's going forward, but if your moment, if your velocity is going backwards, that's not the same thing, right? Because it considers direction as well. Um, also, one of the assumptions and um, the key terms that you also have to remember is that no net external, if no net external force is applied, momentum is conserved, meaning if, a net external net force is applied, momentum is not conserved. The reason why is because P equals MV, right? We know that um, from this equation for momentum. But we also know that, uh, let's type this out. We also know that the net force F, right? That equals MA, right? And what is A? A is the change in velocity over time. Um, that's a really bad term. Sorry about that. Um, right, acceleration equals VF minus V initial over time. Right, it's a change in velocity over time. So if we substitute that into the equation, we actually get m v final minus v initial right, over time. And if you distribute if you distribute the m to the v um, f and the v i, you get m v f minus m v i, right? And m v f is your final momentum, and your m v i is your initial momentum, and that's relative to time. So your change in momentum over time. So that's why um you cannot have a net external force. If you do have a net external force, that means that you have acceleration, meaning your velocity changes. If your velocity changes, that's directly proportional to your change in momentum. Okay, so if you have an acceleration, that equals a change in velocity. If you have a change in velocity, that equals a change in momentum. That's why no net external force, um, if it is applied and net external force is applied, your momentum is not conserved. But if it um, is not applied, your momentum is usually conserved. So we kind of relate momentum with energy. The reason why is because um, energy and momentum is related um, in many ways. So for instance, if I have kinetic energy, right? I have one, um, one half mv squared, um, right? If I say that this object has a starting, starts off with a velocity of this, has a mass m, right? You can calculate its kinetic energy. However, if it collides with an object, which we'll see later, um, and sticks to it, its energy is not conserved. Well, it, but its momentum is conserved. Um, however, if you have a system where you have, let's say a car, right? And you're just ramming it into, um, I don't know, another car, right? And the moment that they collide, that car in the front bumps forward, right? If it's like, it's like um, you're about to kick a soccer ball, right? When you score a goal, you run towards the soccer ball and then your momentum transfers into that ball's momentum. But that ball's momentum, um, that mass of the ball is less than yours. So um, it goes faster than you, right? When you kick, it goes really fast. Um, that's kind of more of where energy is conserved as well as uh, momentum. All right, so let's clear this. All right, and let's move forward. So um, impulse is basically changing momentum over time. And before, as I said, um, Force um, change in momentum is basically, let's see if we can do this. All right, so the change in momentum is P 
pf minus pi, right? And that is relative to time. Um, and we know that uh, we know that mv equals p. So if we have a final momentum where your mass remains constant, we would denote that as mvf equals p f. And same thing, we'd have mv i equals p i. So if you have a PF minus a PI, you're really doing MVF minus MVI. And remember, that's all over time. Now, because you have the M, right, um, in MVF and MVI, right, and this is, again, this is change in P, which we denote as delta P, right? You could factor out the M and you would get M parentheses VF minus vr, and this is all over time. But you see this term right here? This is acceleration, because acceleration is um, mvf minus vi over t. So you write this out as ma equals change in momentum. But ma is really f equals ma, because we know that the net force equals ma. So this is where you get Newton's second law. Um, but impulse is basically changing the momentum. However, we use the equation force times time. Basically, your change, um, your basically, if you apply a force to an object, um, let's say it's a really big force, right, and you're applying for a short amount of time, you have a really larger change in momentum. Because um, suddenly this object is being accelerated and its velocity changes rapidly in a small duration of time. Um, this equation is equal to, I believe we denote that as I or impulse. Um, it's probably a different variable, but usually if it talks about impulse, which is change in momentum, this is basically the same thing as um, force times time. If you want to see the derivation for the force and time, is really similar to what I just showed, except kind of different, uh, but it does come from the same thing, which is MVF minus MVI. Um, and if you want, you could stick along at the end, and um, I'll be happy to show you. But for the sake of time, um, I'm just going to sh basically show you the equation, which is force times time, and that is changing momentum. Okay, and that's relative to time. All right, clear drawings and let's move on. And again, right, this is the image which basically shows that, um, right, if your time increases, your impulse increases. Same thing, if your, if your force increases, so does your impulse. If it decreases, um, then um, impulse inc decreases as well. It's a proportional relationship. Okay, so when I, before I talked about energy and momentum, how they're related, this is where they're related. So in, um, in collisions and explosions, which we deal with momentum, um, let's say an object, right? You have a firecracker and explodes into small fragments. Obviously, we're not talking about like an actual bomb or anything. We're talking about, you know, like celebrational um, equipment, right? Um, like firework or something like that. Um, if the object is exploding in midair, right? The fragments, like all the, if you could look at every single particle um, when it, like all the fragments of the actual um, firework when it explodes, if you add up all their masses times their velocities, their momentum is actually equal. Um, this is basically true in all scenarios, unless again, if a net external force is applied. So explosions, momentum is conserved. Collisions, momentum is also conserved. However, energy may not be conserved in a collision. The reason why is because um, right here, you have something called an elastic collision, which is where um, two objects, they're colliding, and at that very instant, um, they just bounce off. They do not stick, or they, they don't have um, a period of time where they stick together. The reason why they don't is because energy is conserved. If they do stick together, um, we actually call that something else. We call that an inelastic collision, which is basically when two objects, they collide, and they stick together. Um, the reason why energy is not conserved is because the moment when they stick, um, they're losing energy already. 
And also when you're colliding together, when you're moving on together, you also have a loss of energy. So um, this is the ela inelastic collision. Remember, momentum is always conserved in this con these, type these two types of collisions, as long as a net external force is not applied. Um, but that does, not, that does not necessarily mean that energy is conserved. So in an inelastic collision, energy is not conserved, but in an elastic collision, energy is conserved. And um, you can always think of it as inelastic is when they stick and elastic is when they bounce off um, instantaneously. So um, an elastic collision doesn't really, is not really realistic because um, in like, obviously in the world, right? We don't really have a perfect, uh, perfectly in el a perfectly elastic collision. Um, the closest you could think of is a billiard ball. Like if, I don't know if you guys play pool or anything. Um, if you actually play it like physically, when you hit the ball, like with the pole, right? Um, it bounces off the other ball, but it makes like a sound, um, like a really loud sound. That sound is basically a loss of energy. So it's almost elastic, but it's not because um, you're, you lose like minimal energy through um, sound. So basically it's almost, it, I mean, elastic collisions are almost like not realistic because you will always have some sort of loss of energy to the environment or something. But um, you should always kind of think like in AP Physics 1, when they ask you, they'll always tell you like a perfectly inelastic or elastic. And you should definitely know from that that momentum is always conserved, but energy is not conserved for inelastic. Energy is conserved for elastic. Okay, it's always vice versa. And you would always know that in order to tell an inelastic collision, they stick together. If it's an elastic collision, they won't stick together. They will bounce off perfectly. All right, so now we're gonna go back to the Kahoot. Um, are there any questions before we start? Any questions like you wanna go over anything? Um, I can go back to the slides, you know, just let me know if you have any questions while I set up the Kahoot. So basically, um, if you want to review again, right? Momentum is force times, um, sorry, momentum is momentum times velocity. Impulse is change in momentum, and that is equal to force times time. Um, you could play around with the equations and actually derive something else, but that's where you get them from. Um, so, and then you also have inelastic and elastic collisions. Inelastic is when, sorry, inelastic is when momentum is conserved, but energy is not. And it sticks together. That's how you can tell. Um, elastic collisions when momentum is also conserved and energy is also conserved and they bounce off um, instantaneously. That would, that's how you would tell them out. And remember, explosions are also conserved with momentum um, because the force that explodes them is considered inside the system. When in energy, um, like two weeks ago, when we talked about energy with the systems, that's why. Because the force is considered inside of the system, meaning it's not an external force. Even though when you explode something, right, that is a force. The explosion itself is a force. But because it's considered within the system, um, it is not, it is not, um, counted as a net external force. All right, so enough of me talking. And if you have any questions, you know, please let me know and we will get started. So if you um, can right now, just get a piece of paper, um, calculator and a pen, and also a tablet or phone that you can use to log on to Kahoot other than your laptop. If you do use a laptop, um, you can log on. Uh, you just need to um, split screen so you would have like one screen on the left with the Kahoot and then one on the right with the Zoom. All right, host. Elastic. Share screen. All right, do you guys see my screen? Just give me a yes in the chat, please. Thank you very much, John. Um,
Okay, no problem. Actually, let me see if I can pull. And this Kahoot will be really short. It's like 13 questions right here. And I don't think there's a lot of math. It's all, um, um, Tiffany, are you playing? Tiffany, um, if you want, you can DM me privately. Just let me know, please. That way I could either start the game or I could wait a couple more minutes for you to get ready. Okay, no problem. All right, so let's get started. And Dorana, you can follow along. All right, so it was the question said asking for the best answer. Object mass times the force acting on it. That's not true because in impulse, it's force times time. It's not mass times force. Mass times force is, um, I don't think there's anything for mass times force. But basically the best answer was impulse, right? You could have a velocity change. That would, that would change your momentum, but it's asking for your best answer. So whenever you talk about a change in momentum, you should have a click in your head, like the light bulb go on, and it's definitely impulse. You have to look for the word impulse. Um, that's the one that usually everyone refers to as impulse. You could explain it saying there's a velocity change, but the key term is impulse, right? Remember, net external force is um, on a system. If the net external force is zero, that means that there's no change in momentum. But just because you don't have any change in momentum doesn't mean you don't have momentum. So it's that one was confusing. 
yeah, it's kind of tricky, right? Um, it's kind of like acceleration, right? If I have no acceleration, doesn't mean I have no velocity. It just means that my velocity is not changing. So my velocity could be 10, it could be 100, it could be 1,000, 1 million. Um, but as long as there's no acceleration, it's not changing. So it's the same thing as momentum. Yeah, okay, so this one was kind of tricky, okay. Um, it does, so, imp, I mean, yeah, it could be true, right? Decreasing the impulse could be true, but the key thing where what paddings do, what airbags do, like if you get in a car crash, what the key thing of an airbag it does is that um, it kind of elongates the time of your collision. So when you hit, right, if you hit a car at 30 miles per hour, right, you're hitting it at a really high velocity, um, and obviously your body has inertia on it, right? So it, it's going to lunge forward. Um, but because of the airbag, it kind of provides a force in the opposite direction that kind of like pushes you backwards. So it slows down your acceleration. So it could be, yeah, decreasing the impulse is true because impulse is change in momentum, right? If you're decreasing your change in momentum, um, that is true. But the key thing is the increase in time. Um, and the reason, so it's not, see, this one is kind of tricky because um, impulse is force times time, right? Um, you are increasing your time, which means that your impulse should also be increasing. But the thing is that when you're increasing your time you're, and your force is constant, your acceleration is actually getting smaller because it's um, keeping the same relationship. All right, let, let, me, let me just draw this up. So, all right, so we know that force, or that's a little bit color. All right, so we know that force equals MA, right? And um, we know that momentum is P equals MV. And we also know that, um, I think, yeah, but I believe this I is force times time, right? Um, you are increasing your time of collision. That's true, I mean, if you wanted to like see a slow mo of a car crash, um, that's what airbags are tend to do. They want to increase your time of your airbag. So your impulse, if your impulse is decreasing, that means that either your force has to decrease or your impulse or your time has to decrease to keep that same relationship. Um, your force is decreasing, but your time is actually supposed to increase. So I guess you could count red. I mean, I guess you could count the triangle red as the correct answer. Um, but the, the key answer, like the reason why, um, is you, that, that's kind of like how, like AP Physics 1 is really tricky because they all look for the specific answer. Like you can't just say very vaguely, like, okay, so why does a person accelerate? You say, because it has a force. Um, you have to be specific saying the net external force and the external force creates acceleration and acceleration creates change of velocity. So you have to be specific and you have to go down to the root. So the question, it is true that your impulse is decreasing but the thing that is decreasing your impulse is actually increasing your time. It is actually the, um, the result of your increase in time. Does that kind of make sense? Like you are correct in a sense, but you should always look for the more specific answer, like um, the root cause. Yeah, um, I mean, you are, you are correct. So I'm actually gonna, I'll, I'll give you the next question. So you can, you can get the next question. I, I will mark it. I'll, the wrong answer. This one is tricky, take your time.
So I'm gonna explain this one. Okay, I actually got this one purposely. Um, so like to make up for the points that you lost. Um, okay, so basically the reason why is Superman. So Superman is throwing a ball, right? Um, like an asteroid, right? And you know that this asteroid's mass has to be greater than Superman, right? Because Superman has a mass and he's like a human. He's not an asteroid. The asteroid is like almost like a moon. So um, you know that the mass of the asteroid has to be greater than, um, let me just draw this out, clear, clear drawing. So M of the asteroid has to be greater than the M of Superman. Right. Um, and we know that force is a pair, it's an action reaction pair because of Newton's third law, right? So we know that the force that Superman applies on the asteroid is the same force that the asteroid applies on Superman. So we know that, um, and we also know the equation from Newton's second law that F equals MA, right? Um, sorry, my stylus is not working really well today, but I will try to correct it. Um, and we know that F equals MA, right? The net force equals MA. So if your force is constant and your MA is, okay, and your acceleration of A, you could set up this relationship. That has to be equal to your M of your asteroid of Superman and your acceleration of Superman. So we know that the mass of this is bigger. This one is bigger than this one. This one's small, small circle. That means that if you want to keep the relationship true, acceleration has to be bigger than your acceleration of the asteroid. Does that kind of make sense? You know that the force is constant because um, of Newton's third law, right? Every force has an equal and opposite reaction. Meaning if I, if I punch the asteroid, like let's say I'm Superman, right? I punch the asteroid in the opposite direction. Um, I'm applying a force on the asteroid, right? But the asteroid is also applying a force on me. It's kind of like saying, even though um, the asteroid was at rest, right? The asteroid didn't apply a, apply a force on Superman. Superman applied the force on a, the asteroid, but the asteroid still applies a equal and opposite reaction because of Newton's third law. It's like running into the wall. The wall doesn't, the wall doesn't run into you. You, you ran into the wall, you, you initiated um, this entire system, right, initiated this reaction. Um, but because of Newton's third law, right, the wall actually applies a force back on you. And you can actually um, see this in real life, which is when you bump into the wall, you bounce back. You bounce back because the wall applies a force back on you, which is equal um, to the force that you applied on the wall. So the same thing is you apply a force on the asteroid, the asteroid still applies a force back on you. But because your mass is smaller than the mass of the asteroid, your acceleration has to be greater than the asteroid. Because you have to keep the relationship true, right? If your MA of, um, of your asteroid equals the MA of, your, of the Superman, right? And your mass of your asteroid is greater than the mass of your Superman, your acceleration of Superman has to be smaller than the acceleration of the asteroid. Um, if you want an example, I can give you in numbers, if you think numbers are easier, right? I know that four times eight has to be equal to um, 32, right? That's the same thing as six times two, right? But what's the relationship between four and 16? 16 is greater than four. But if you look at eight and two, two is smaller than eight and it's proportional, right? Four is um, one fourth of 16 and two is one fourth of eight. So that's basically kind of how the mass and acceleration thing uh, that works out. Does that kind of help out? All right, all right, great. Um, let's move on.
Okay, so you might be questioning why is it long and short? The reason why is because you can have a large force over a small period of time, right? Momentum is changing momentum over time. So if your time is small, right, in the denominator, um, your change in momentum is big because your numerator is bigger than your denominator. However, we also know that change in momentum is force times time. So if your time increases, right, your time uh, increases with a large force, your, your gradual change of momentum is also increasing. So this question is kind of tricky. It's relative to um, your time. So it's not like, what is your greatest change in momentum at the, t at the end of this like time t, right? It's more of um, how can you create this great change in momentum? So it is short and long. Because again, short as in like a car crash, right? If you're decelerating your momentum at a very large um, at a very small period of time, that is a great change in momentum. But you could say the same thing um, compared to if you had a car that was accelerating for 10, 10 minutes, right? It was going from zero to 210 miles per hour, right? Um, obviously that's crazy, but that is also a great change in momentum. So it's, it's relative to long and short. It's basically time, like time decides your change in momentum. Um, all right, so next question. Okay, so if a ping pong, right, ping pong ball has smaller mass than the launcher, right? So we know that impulse comes from Newton's second law, right? Momentum comes from Newton's second law. So if you apply an impulse on the ball, right, which is a change in momentum, right? If, you're, if your ball is changing in momentum, that means that your launcher is also changing in momentum because it, it's an equal and opposite force. It's kind of like the thing when I talk about the, the question with the Superman and the asteroid. This is the same thing with the ping pong, right? Except it's um, in another word for the force is the impulse. Does that kind of make sense? Like it was the same, it's the same ideology as the Superman and that one. It's just um, impulse instead of force. And you know that force, um, the launcher, okay, so let, let me just draw this up. All right, um, so we know that force, right, equals mass times acceleration and um, when when the ball, like when the ping pong launches from the launcher, they apply the same force to each other. But the ping pong ball gets launched like it, it goes like off into mid space because the ping pong ball's mass is so small. It's like putting a lead ball onto a ping pong ball launcher that's not meant for lead balls and the ball, the lead ball goes um, only like two meters. Yeah, impulse is force times time. But your time is the same. It's, you're not saying like the ping pong ball um, has a greater time of launching compared to like, okay, so, all right, let me just draw this up. No, the force is never greater on the ping pong ball. Remember, Newton's third law says that every um, force has an equal and opposite reaction, meaning the force applied onto the ball is the same as the force applied back onto the launcher. But because the mass of the ball is so small, its acceleration is like so big compared to the launcher. Yeah, all right, so yeah, this is tricky. So good thing that you're taking the practice right now. So that's good. All right, last question. I, yeah, two, second to last. Yes, this is this one is good. Remains the same. All right.
All right. Um, perfect timing. It's three hundred one. Congratulations to Xiang. I don't know how you got first place because I got seven questions right and you got seven questions right as well. But um, lol. I know. Uh, that's that's kind of weird, but I think it's the streaks, like the faster you answer it. But basically, um, I actually wanted to do some practice problems with you guys from the workbook. Um, but it is three hundred two, so. Um, I'm not forcing you guys to stay if you don't want to. So if you do want to stay, you want to do some practice problems from the workbook, I can do them with you guys. Um, and since we only have three people today, we should be faster than seven people because usually um, because there's more questions. But if you don't want to, um, you guys are free to leave. Remember, if you have any questions, you can always let me know in email or Google Classroom. Um, but if you do want to do the questions, please stay. And, you know, I'm happy to help you guys out. 